Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 63 in the series, and I'm calling this one Sheep, Wool, and Lenten, because I've got a report from the Sheep and Wool Festival, I've got an FO, which is the Lenten vest, and I've got lots of other, you know, sheepy, woolly, yarny goodness, as usual. <laughs> uh, I am coming to you from Urbana, Illinois. It is a rainy Sunday out there. I just went out in the pasture and kind of rounded up the sheep and called the kittens in from the woods, and everyone has the barn to kind of shelter in, so I'm not too worried about them. The dogs are quiet on the couch. <laughs> we, have, we have quite a menagerie of uh, animals around here. Uh, if, you, if you're if you new to the cast, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the menagerie of animals. <laughs> um, and if you're coming back, it's so nice to see you. Thank you for coming back to join me again. Uh, usually I would tell you what I'm wearing, but I'm not wearing anything extra special because it's still uh, on average like 80 and 90 degrees here uh, in the daytime. So I've been struggling to uh, get to class and be comfortable and not like too hot or too cold or, you know, it's that, it's that time of year. You guys all know it. Um, a lot of people say this is the time of year where they break their knitting back out or their crochet or whatever it is that they're working on because they didn't work on it in the summer. But um, you guys know I am a full year-round knitter, so <laughs> I will knit anything, anytime. I mean, there have been summers where I've had woolly blankets like on my lap while I'm knitting them. Crazy, I know. Uh, so what's in the episode today? I have got, I have to look at my notes, uh, I have a big thank you to all the Kofi um, donations. I want to make sure I get to that. Uh, I have an announcement about the next Farm to Skeen yarn, which is coming very, very soon. Uh, I have a report from the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival, the Lenten uh, FO, uh, some info on where this podcast is going to go in the next couple of months. And then I have a roundup of fun stuff from Sweet Georgia, uh, making stories, and at the end I'll give you a little glimpse, uh, another glimpse into farm life. We did some hoof trimming uh, earlier in the month. So you have all that to look forward to. And a giveaway winner for the maple syrup from last time around with the interview with Kim Goodling. So first things first, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who has been involved in this podcast over the last few years, and especially this last year. Um, I really appreciated, as I always say, your messages of support and inquiry and interest and all of your posts over on the Ravelry thread, or we have a community over there, because that's what really keeps this podcast going. Um, knowing that you guys are out there and that um, you're talking to each other about yarn and fiber and that you have fun questions and that you just want to connect. So that's that's awesome and thank you. The other huge thank you is to those of you who have donated, um, given me a coffee and the Kofi program. <laughs> There's this great program called Kofi, if you're not familiar with it, it's K-O-F-I. And makers and um, folks who are doing creative work or just other um, activities can ask people to buy them a, a coffee if they like what they're doing. So that's what I've been doing for the last year and I never expected anyone to even catch on to it. I didn't announce it or anything. Um, but so many of you have bought me a coffee uh, in the last year and I just want to publicly thank you. Um, so I'm going to put your names up on the screen here. I've, I've had some anonymous donors but I've also had donations from um, Sharon, uh, Elian Noyes, uh, Lindsay, Janet, the Franciscan Spinner, uh, Joanna, Teresa Allen, Brigitte, Emma Butcher, Angie, Natalia, Candy, Diane, uh, Mars and Sandy and I just want to publicly thank you guys. The donations that you've um, given, the coffees that you've bought me have um, allowed me to get some new equipment, which is the lights, and pay for shipping on giveaways, um, lots of other good stuff. So I really appreciate those donations, and if anyone wants to get involved, I do leave the link down in the notes, in the show notes. Um, and it's just, uh, it's a nice way to support people. I know I've bought some other folks' coffees, and it's, it's just kind of like a nice little... Um, I don't know, a little incentive. People are out there and they like what you do. So so there it is. And thank you so much to all of you who have donated so far. It's meant the world to me. Um, if you're looking for me elsewhere on the nets, you can find me as Knitting the Stash, just about everywhere. And that is on YouTube, obviously, <laughs> on Ravelry, on Instagram, and on the blog, which is knittingthestash.wordpress.com. So let's move on to Wisconsin Sheep and Wool, which just happened uh, last weekend and kind of threw my schedule for a little bit of a loop. It was also the weekend of uh, my son's soccer tournament. So we did soccer Friday night and Saturday and then left in a huge hurry for Wisconsin Sheep and Wall and got there by, I think, Saturday night at about 8 o'clock. The competition for the Sheep to Shawl, which is the reason that we were there, was supposed to start Sunday morning at 8 a.m. 
And so I didn't get to really see much of the festival this year, um, but that's fine. I, I don't mind splitting between Zach and I's interests. So we do soccer with him, and then he comes to Sheep and Wool with me. I thought that was pretty sweet. So uh, we stayed with uh, Kathy and Sue in there. They had rented a little trailer, and a couple of other team members uh, had tents out behind us. They brought family members with them, just like I did. And we all set up for the Sheep to Shawl on Sunday morning. And the Sheep to Shawl competition, for those of you who haven't ever heard of one, um, basically you start with either a sheep or a fleece, <laughs> but basically raw material, and you take it all the way through the stages of carding, spinning, plying, because it has to be a two-ply at least usually, um, and then weaving uh, a shawl. So our, um, a couple of members of our team uh, put together the, the hand-spun, they hand-spun a warp for the loom. Um, the design was original by one of our team members, Lisa. She came up with this beautiful design. And uh, then we just, we carded and spun our border luster uh, fleece for, I think the competition lasted about four hours. You have to take a mandatory lunch break. And it's, as usual, this is the third time our same team has done it. Some people switched position in the team, um, but it's the third time that we've been together to do this event. Uh, and it was so much fun to spin with them and to be with them and to spend the day with them um, and to be kind of like frantic with them. And uh, But we also had just a fun time. There were so many people that kind of gathered around our um, the competition area and they wanted to ask questions and each team has a liaison that kind of talks to them. Uh, and the other three teams were, they made some brilliant, beautiful things. Uh, one other team was like us in that they used um, natural fibers, natural colors, multiple colors of natural fibers, um, which is what we did. We had a dark Shetland warp and then we had the border luster um, weft, which was a little bit lighter because it was kind of all um, blended together, some light fiber and some dark. So to get that contrast between the weft and the warp so you could see the design. Um, and then two other teams did some beautiful dye work on their fleece uh, so that they had a, a kind of like orangey yellow sunset kind of colored shawl. And then the team right now, I'm gesturing because that's where the teams were relative to me in space. The team right next to, to us on this side um, did a beautiful job on a purple kind of gradient um, shawl it was just gorgeous i mean i thought they should have won first place because it was beautiful um and they i recognized them and the other group um i think all four of us were teams that had been there in one way or another whether or not the members were the same of the teams they were the same kind of guilds or groups uh so it was fun it was great to to be there and to see everyone and to kind of like run around at lunchtime and right before the uh or right after the competition ended to try to check out some of the sto the shops and the the scene and i took zach over to um see the sheepdog trials uh so we watched the crick and whistle trials right at like 7 30 in the morning uh, and he was like wow these are really impressive and i was like yeah it's like one of the best things about the sheep and wool show is going to see the dogs um so anyway Competition was great. We really had fun doing the actual shawl making. Um, unfortunately, when it came to the actual competition part, which I'm not a big fan of anyway. I mean, we have some team members who really want to win. <laughs> I'm not really one of those people. I'm not into competition or team sports in that kind of way. I just really like getting together and doing something. And like, we were all so excited when we finished the shawl. Um, and that feeling of, of actually accomplishing something with a group and, and doing it together was really, that's, that's to me what it's about. So I don't sweat this other part of it too much, but it, it was a little annoying um, when we got up to the moment of the actual competition and the judging. Um, the judges actually changed the scoring. <laughs> I was just kind of like, huh, you can do that? I mean, as a teacher, I'm a little bit like, if I give out a grading rubric and my students do what I tell them to do, then that's what I grade them on. But the judges at the Sheep to Shawl in Wisconsin were not exactly sticking to the guidelines that they gave us. And they gave us a sheet of guidelines. It was like, these are the point values, this is what happens. But they decided to change everything after the competition was over. So we were a little bit like, the whole team kind of looked at each other. We were trying to be cool and subtle about it, but we were all looking at each other like, can they do that? Like, is that, that's not cool, right? Um, so some of the changes benefited us and some of them didn't. Um, and like I said, I'm not really into competition, but I am into like fairness. So it just felt a little wrong to me. Um, and the team that I thought should have won, purple team, didn't win. They got second, which, you know, fair enough. Um, and luckily everybody's shawls were, everybody but one. So three of the four teams shawls were long enough this year. That was good. And ours was definitely long enough this year. Um, uh, and so, yeah, we didn't win. That's, that's totally fine. But the rule changing was just a little bit like, oh, 
not so cool with that. So I think maybe as a guild, I don't know if we'll go back and do the competition part again. I'd love to keep doing it as a demo, and I know we'll do it at Green Castle, and um, I wouldn't mind just going to Sheep and Wool and just doing it as a demo and then just walking away from the competition part because the, or the judging part, because that just, it just doesn't matter to me. <laughs> so if my team wanted to do it, you know, I'd go and participate with them and then just be like, see you later, have fun, I'm gonna go shopping. <laughs> Vendors, <laughs> go watch the sheepdogs. Um, so it was, it was good. It was a little frustrating, a little good. Um, we had, we had fun, and the shawl we made is really beautiful. Um, the dogs are coming in. Hi, Tink. Uh, the shawl we made is really beautiful, and uh, I'll try to put a picture in here of it, and hopefully I'll put some other pictures in here so that you can see what our competition was like uh, all along the way. Linton. <laughs> Let's move on to a, some finished knitting objects as opposed to weaving objects. Uh, this is the Lenten Vest by Natasha Hornby, and I talked about it very briefly on the last um, cast because I was talking to you guys about the armholes and finishing off the armholes and what a big difference it makes. Um, and I think that's particularly important with linen because linen, as I've, as I've talked about on here before, plant fibers, when you knit with them, they're much less forgiving than, say, wool um, in terms of your tension and gauge and all kinds of other things. So pretty much if you make mistakes, they show a lot more <laughs> with plant fibers than with wool. Wool kind of like fills in the spaces. It can kind of like stretch or, you know, compress to kind of like mm, give you much more uniformity, but plant fibers, not, not as much. <laughs> so, so I was talking to you guys about the armhole finishing and you can see the, the finishing that happens on these armholes is a, an applied I-cord and it really does finish these arms really nicely and kind of pull all the fabric up and in, and I showed you that last time. So this time I wanted to talk a little bit about the design itself and the yarn and the color choices and all that kind of good stuff. So I found Natasha Hornby's patterns on Ravelry, I guess, in the wild because I had a few of them favorited when I went to kind of check her out again. Um, but one of you guys, Kate Spittler, um, was test knitting a pattern for Natasha and that's kind of what led me back to her. So I wanted to say thank you, Kate, <laughs> for sending me back over to Natasha's patterns. They're really some beautiful, there's some beautiful stuff over there. Um, her version is uh, in a black and white, uh, which I think is a nice contrast for this vest. You do need a really dark color and at least, you kind of need three colors, um, but at the very least a dark and a light so that you get this um, contrast on the ribbing. I used Sparrow, um, which is a 100% organic linen from uh, Quinson Company. And these are the two, two of the three colors. Let's see if the camera will do it. Yes, there you go. Two of the three colors that I used. This is the light and the dark that I used as a contrast on the ribbing. And like I said, Sparrow is a 100% organic linen and Quinson Company makes some beautiful yarns. I've knit a few different sweaters out of their um, yarns now and I, I quite like what they do from the linen all the way. I've used some of their wool as well. Um, and you need to have that contrast. This color is um, this third color was kind of a marled version of these two colors, which is kind of a nice effect. And I actually found out um, about this particular color pattern, and I want to get the names right here, um, from Petra Mar on Ravelry. Her project page has a vest that's very similar to this one um, in that she's using the same colors, and she got her color <laughs> palette from um, someone named Biggie on Ravelry. So all of these folks are... Um, all of this is to say, I guess, that uh, checking out the project pages on Ravelry can make a huge difference um, in your finished project. So uh, Natasha has this great, beautiful black and white and gray kind of version, and then I found um, Petra's version um, of using this kind of pink uh, yarn from Quinz and Company, and that led me to go ahead and just purchase that yarn. Um, so these project pages can really help you look at different colors and color schemes and body fit. And my, my guild mates and I are always talking about that. When we go to knit or think about knitting a new project, we always check the project pages because you kind of want to see what it looks like on different bodies, what it looks like when people aren't posed perfectly for like the magazine shot where they can pull a little bit of the sweater off to the side or sit in just the perfect way. And you want some real life people wearing these objects to see what they actually look like. Um, so thank you, Petra and her inspiration, Biggie, on Ravelry for picking out this beautiful color palette. Um, and I'll put the, in the show notes, I'll put links to the colors and you can check my project page. I've got it all linked up there. So if you were interested in using the same palette, you'd know where to go. Um, and I'd say Quince & Company has um, other marled yarns in different colors and then the kind of yarns that they seem to be marled from. So you could go with this kind of, um, 
color scheme, but in different colors if you wanted to. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. So the things about this um, vest, uh, and I was I made a vest in part because I'm still trying to compete in the um, Insumoto Dodecathon, which is 12 sweaters in one year, and it's just 12 adult garments. Uh, and I took a break to do those little baby garments, but um, I'm also thinking, okay, if I don't knit sleeves, I may be able to get something in here. And part of that was because I started another sweater, got halfway through the month, and had to completely frog it, so I needed something a little bit quicker. And this vest wasn't exactly that. <laughs> it wasn't quick. And I think in part because it's fingering weight linen, uh, that's two different things. It's finger weight and it's linen. So those two things take a little extra time. Um, one of the things that I really appreciated about Natasha's pattern is that uh, if you're comfortable with working color work, which I am in the round, um, she also gives you the option, especially when it comes to this ribbing, for how to work color work in the flat. Um, it, because this kind of ribbing requires that you're working in the flat and that you're purling. Yeah, <laughs> so if you've never done that before, it can be a little bit of a challenge. And her pattern gives you an option for basically doing a slipped stitch version, um, like working color work in two color ribbing with a slipped stitch uh, kind of technique. So um, uh, if you're gonna do that on the right side rows where it was just like knitting in the round and I was just knitting every stitch, I did my regular color work. I hold my yarns in two different hands and I was able to just quickly like knit, knit, knit this color, knit, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, no problem. Um, and I had learned the ribbing technique for that side of things, for the right side of the work from um, Albina McLaughlin's pattern, um, Song and Dance, because she has a great pearled and ribbed um, multicolor, two color collar on that one. And so I had to learn that technique there. Um, but when you're on the wrong side, <laughs> it gets a little bit tricky. And my hands were just not adept enough at moving the yarn in the ways that they needed to move. So I used Natasha's um, special technique for the wrong side rows. And basically what you do is um, you take your one of your colors all the way across, slipping all the opposite color stitches. So if I were working the, the lighter pink color, I would work across with the pink color. Um, in this case, purling, and I would slip all of the darker colored um, stitches that I came to. Then I would slide all the work all the way back to the beginning. I wouldn't turn my work. I'd slide it all the way back to the beginning, kind of like with brioche. Um, and then I'd work the dark colored stitches and slip the light colored stitches. So, uh, and I'd work the dark colored stitches in knit because they need to be pearls on this side for the ribbing. So, haha. <laughs> That is an awesome technique, and it made the work so much faster. I know it sounds slower because you're working the row twice, but if you're not as adept like I am at doing the wrong side rows with the um, the purl stitches, then you're going to be much better off just sliding it back and forth, and it's so much faster and it's so much more comfortable. I keep finding this wrong side color work lately. I'm actually working on a scarf from Making Stories right now that I'll show you. Pause for a moment. So this is the scarf from the Making Stories collection, which is a work in progress for me. And it has this beautiful color work right in the center. But since it's knit in the flat, it requires that you do color work on both sides. Uh, and, you know, this one includes floats on the back. Uh, and so the pearl rows of that were, <laughs> yes, another challenge for me. But I was able to actually do them this time around when I was working on this, I think in part because I was getting more and more comfortable with it with this particular project, and then I got to this and kept practicing. So all that's to say that if there's a technique you're not as comfortable with, practice makes perfect. And finding little hacks like Natasha's slip stitch, work the row twice kind of a thing um, can be super helpful. And it can help you take on projects that you might be a little bit nervous about because you're like, oh, I can't do that technique or it's gonna slow me down or whatever it is. Um, if you find those hacks and those workarounds or you, are just willing to practice it over and over again, it will get better and you can do the projects that you really wanna do and you're thinking about doing even if um, they seem a little bit more daunting or advanced um, for what your hands can do. Um, yeah, other things about this vest, um, I'm pretty happy with the fit. Size-wise, I went down a size or basically I knit the size that would have perfectly kind of fit me. So bust size, I think it was a 34 and I went ahead and knit a 34. Um, 
with certain materials I would do that and with certain ones I wouldn't. With linen I wanted to knit the same size as my bust measurement because I know that plant fibers are going to stretch. And I watched um, my husband's sweater that I knit him out of hemp um, just has relaxed quite a bit and I knit that one before I knew a lot about plant fibers and knitting with plant fibers and I need to go back and kind of like shore that up a little bit. Um, and so with this one I decided to just go with the actual measurement. No ease built into it at all because the ease is going to come with the plant fiber. The ease is going to come from its, its own drape and the way that it hangs and the way that it stretches. And the more you wash linen and cotton and hemp, the softer they get and the more kind of like relaxed they get as fibers. So this is actually stretched out, spread out after its first washing um, to I think probably a 35 if not a 36 right now. And so it's kind of, it's like perfect. So, uh, so yeah, that's what I, I think that's what I want to say about this guy. It's a really fun knit. Um, the body goes just, it's just stuck in it and you're just knitting in the flat. So that just goes around. It is a top down, um, knit. So you do start, um, with your little bits and pieces on the back shoulders and you're kind of casting on stitches for the neck and you're kind of picking up stitches. Um, or you're casting on other stitches and working down. So you're actually working these pieces, the front and the back, separately um, down to the armpits and then joining everything up and then continuing to work down. And only then do you work your um, three needle bind off at the top to give you these shoulder seams, which I think I showed you before. You're doing your shoulder seams in this cool contrast color. Um, and that's how you join the whole thing up. But it is a top down sweater in the flat. It's a pretty interesting knit that way, construction-wise. So, so this was a fun knit, and I would recommend Natasha Warnby's other patterns, um, if only for their aesthetic value. I know that I've looked at um, many of them, and they're really quite beautiful and different and really pretty, and she does things with color and slip stitches. And Anyway, I like her style, and having knit one of her patterns now, I know that she's um, a very competent pattern writer and designer, and that she'll give you some cool hacks for parts of the pattern that you might be concerned about or that you might need to be able to work in a separate kind of way, just like she did with the two color ribbing in the flat. Yeah. <laughs> so Natasha Hornby, go, go for it. So the last kind of little bit and piece of stuff here is that I wanna make a few um, announcements for you before I get to the farm life and the giveaway. Um, the first one is that uh, this podcast, where are we gonna go from here? Because we've almost finished our year of books. I have one more book for you next podcast that'll kind of round out our year of rare and hard to find knitting books. And I'd like to keep that conversation going over on the Ravelry thread, but I'm kind of moving on a little bit. And one of the things I've been exploring um, of late is Norwegian patterns and thinking about how to source them, source the yarn and translate them and modify them um, in some interesting ways. So at the very least, um, for a few episodes of this cast, I'm going to be talking about um, Dale Garn's Norwegian patterns. And I have one right now that's on the needles that I translated, and it should be kind of a little bit of an adventure for us. And if anybody else is working on translated patterns, this will be the next couple of episodes will be a moment of commiseration for all of us. So we can talk about translation, we can talk about knitting from, um, knitting patterns and traditions in other cultures, and we can talk about um, how you modify things when you're not even sure if you've translated them the right way. <laughs> so that'll be in the next few episodes. I think it'll be kind of fun. And I have a beautiful sweater on the needles that I just can't wait to show you guys. Uh, other announcements. Um, for Sweet Georgia, I just wanted to let you guys know, um, this is a really cool um, collaboration that's going on over there. There's this school of Sweet Georgia where Felicia Lowe um, posts a lot of classes and has some of them are free and some of them are, you have to pay for them through a subscription to the um, school. Um, but if you like Craftsy and you're more interested in spinning and weaving, you would like the School of Sweet Georgia a lot because the classes over there are really great. And they've been kind of building their library of classes. But the one that's just come out that I'm so excited about is Rachel Smith's um, How to Spin for a Sweater. So Rachel Smith is the host of the Wool and Spinning podcast, which was pretty much, aside from Fiber Track, one of the first podcasts I ever watched because she talked all about spinning when I was trying to learn to spin. And she was like my teacher for, I don't know how long. I, I went back and watched nearly all of her ep uh, episodes from like number one all the way up. Um, 
and learned so much about spinning from her. And so this class is her specifically talking about how to spin for sweater knitting. And I'm just like, yes, <laughs> I love sweaters, sweater garment design, you guys know this. So it's the perfect class. I've made it through about a third of it so far. Um, and it's chock full of information. She's a great teacher. If you've ever watched her podcast, you know her kind of like way of teaching and her mannerisms, and she's just really a wonderful, wonderful teacher. So I'm excited about um, checking out that episode or not that episode, <laughs> I'm excited about checking out that class um, more and kind of finishing it. One of my goals is to spin to knit a sweater and I think what that would mean for me is slowing down in a certain kind of way and recognizing that I can't get a sweater finished every month um, and I think that might be actually kind of an interesting and good thing to do so I'll just, I'll keep you posted on that. If you're interested in checking out the class, I'll put a link in the show notes to it. Uh, one other announcement, I mentioned the Making Stories um, September collection which came out and I'm working on the shawl right now which I'll tell you about in the next episode but that September um, collection is out. It's got four sweaters, a shawl, some socks, it's some beautiful stuff and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Okay, I think we're down to the giveaway. So let me give, let me tell you who won the giveaway. We had a um, beautiful giveaway from Kim, Kim Goodling of Vermont Grandview Farm and it was for some maple syrup straight off of her farm. Uh, and I picked a winner. We had, I think, over 70 um, entries. And the winner, let me pull it up here. The winner was uh, generated by Random Number Generator and it was Shirley Knits123 and Shirley Knits123. I, I featured one of her patterns um, from the modification knit along that we did this year. So Shirley, congratulations, you are the winner of the maple syrup. And this is what Shirley said for her entry. She said, I've not been exposed to farm life much, but I respect the endless work that goes into running a farm and the labor that it takes to harvest your efforts. If I could, I'd like to spend a week at a farm working half a day and taking photos for future paintings that I'd like to do. Also, I've become more aware of the different breeds of sheep through the Livestock Conservancy Initiative Shave Them to Save Them program. I talked about that on here a while back. Um, it's a great program. Uh, which I support by purchasing yarn. I have a lack of knowledge on many things farm related, but I'm always willing to learn and to try new things. So Shirley, thank you so much for sharing a beautiful post and for joining in the giveaway. Congratulations. I will, uh, once I get your info, I'll forward it to Kim. So congratulations on winning that maple syrup, Shirley, and I hope it arrives in your post box very soon. Um, and one final thing for today, I guess, if any of you are interested in sticking around for farm life, um, we did some hoof trimming and general kind of like body composition and parasite checks on the sheep um, a couple weeks ago and I thought I'd put in some photographs of that for you here. I had never really understood what hoof trimming was about with sheep but it's pretty much like they have a, um, uh, their toenail is kind of like their entire hoof and if you turn it over they have a kind of soft spot in the middle and then the hoof edges can grow unevenly around the hoof. So Katie, who um, uh, helps Kathy out on Seven Sisters Farm, uh, came over to our sheep and we kind of corralled all the sheep in the barn and we did the basic body check of them. So we checked um, kind of at their hips and their ribs to see how much, um, kind of like you, you over the dog to see if, how much weight they have on them. Um, and most of the sheep checked out very well. I'm proud to say, I guess, that Dolly has had a lot of extra apples. <laughs> and so she had a little bit more body to her <laughs> than some of the others. Um, so we checked their basic body composition and then we checked um, for parasites. So you kind of pull their eyelid down and look um, underneath the, in the red kind of pink part of their eye and you want to see that it's um, looking nice and healthy. If it's, if it's looking kind of drained or not as um, pink, then um, they might have a higher parasite load. So you're kind of checking their eyes for that kind of thing. Uh, so we did that, we did the body composition, then we did the hoofs. So Katie would turn the feet over, kind of behind them like, you know, like you would with a horse. And she had some um, kind of like sharp, uh, they were like scissor-like kind of things. I'm not sure what the tool is actually called. And she would cut around um, the extra kind of toenail that was growing on the hoof to make sure that it was even on the bottom. And that way when the sheep go out walking, they're not kind of like walking funny. So that took us maybe an hour or two and got all the sheep in there and got them all checked out and they did a really good job and had, we, I was like worried, oh no, they're gonna hate us from here on out because we've brought them into the barn and cut their nails and they don't like it. But Katie's like, no, 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 they'll forget. And sure enough, they, they were just, just as friendly as ever that afternoon and they weren't scared of the barn or anything like that. So 
it was a good experience and uh, yeah, it was just one more to add to the list. I've gone over to Kathy's farm and done um, deworming with her and the body composition check before, but this was, um, this was new, so more about sheep. And our sheep are actually going back to Kathy's farm, I think as of October 1st, because they are going to be, uh, I think they're gonna be bred this year. Um, so maybe there'll be some baby lambs, yeah. So that's farm life for you. And I think that's all I have for this episode. So I will see you guys in a couple of weeks and I wish you much happy spinning and knitting and weaving and all the other crafty things that you do in the meantime. Take care.